somebody at the record button. That must have been. Dan, are you in charge? I believe so, yes. Okay, okay somebody's in charge because we're recording, so mind your manners. All right, first of all, let's get started. I had a prayer request sent in by Ken. He's trying to get up. You know, he missed his uh, Thanksgiving with his kids due to his... Uh, kneecap surgery so he is trying to get up there and he has he's not feeling well and he doesn't want to miss his christmas trip as well so he just prayed uh for a, an overall healing because he's just not he's under the weather sounds like dana probably yeah um, probably. so if you guys this week could remember uh ken and your prayers i would appreciate that yeah. dana you were gonna you had a couple of uh items that you wanted to 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 let the guys and gals know about yeah um Oksana lost a child about uh, i don't know if i said anything about a month ago and she is now what's called a high-risk mom to be she's seeing a cardiologist and she's seeing a, a specialist OBGYN. so it's a prayer request that she will get healthy and they'll be able to conceive a healthy child um Oksana also, is his daughter-in-law right uh, she and Brian got married this past January. Um, Patrick is his freelance income's dropping, been consistently dropping the last 12 months. And now that he has all his kids, which is a good thing, he has four kids now living under one roof. He needs uh, more uh, better income. That's another prayer request. And I appreciate y'all praying for those folks. At idle hands, guys. I guess yeah, now you got stuff to pray about. Yeah. So I'm, Amen. I'm coming to you, obviously, live from Utah. Hopefully, my video is working okay on your end. Nobody's made any comments. Am I doing all right? Or am I is my audio and video slurring in any way? Good. The audio seemed to be just a little bit. A little bit off. Well, it could be the spiked yeah. eggnog Shuggy gave me last night. Oh, yeah. I think it, <laughs> I think we've run into this in Utah before, where we have a where we have a slow internet. I'm getting an echo feedback. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you guys. It's Donna. She's got two. Oh, Donna. Did I turn things. it off? All right, so uh, let's see. I had a couple yeah. of requests too. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Both of Donna. Okay. Um, Andrea uh, possibly has pancreatic cancer. I didn't know that. We, uh, who is that? Andrea who. Miller, she um, is kind of basically an aunt to me. Uh, they used to live in Vieira, but they moved to Lakeland. And um, she's a uh, medical director for hospice. And she hasn't had any tests, but she knows all the symptoms. So she's um, basically, she's very concerned about it. And it's an effect that she's um, not been able to do her work emotionally. So she's going to take two weeks or two months off from her work. But just pray that, that, one, that it's not cancer, and two, that uh, she would be in better spirits emotionally and spiritually. She's really down. And then um, my friend Fred, uh, he's got some health issues, and they're, they jumped right to a conclusion that he's got cancer. And um, he's been down this road before and uh, doesn't really trust what they're saying, so he's looking at other routes, but he's concerned about what might is actually going on with his health so it's his health in general and, and his mental well-being so he's very frustrated with the medical uh professions in general so he's very skeptical and just pray that he gets the wisdom and find out what exactly is going on all right dan thank you yes uh, Jim, would you be able to, hi, Paul, I just saw you on there. Uh, Jim, 
Would you be able to open us up in prayer this morning? I will. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you for the many blessings that you give us, thanking you for the opportunity to study your word, to be in a place where we can study your word. I thank you, Lord, for personally delivering us back from Stewart, Florida this morning hmm. and, uh, and did that safely. Uh, and I thank you, Lord, for the hard work that Lynn puts in to wherever he is to bring the message to us. We ask you, Father, to open our hearts and our ears and let us hear and receive what you have for us. And, and we pray for our friend Andy and for Fred. We pray that your healing touch will, will be upon them. Uh, we thank you for everything that you do for us, Father. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus, as we're guided by your Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right. One last one, guys. This is kind of on a sad note. You know, we're all family, right? Right. It doesn't matter what church you go to. It's just one church as far as God is considered. Well, we have a, a church in our community called Melbourne Community Church. They're on the corner of... Um, of Wickham and, and uh, 192 in a uh, strip plaza, Melbourne Community Church. Uh, the pastor there was a teacher at Calvary Chapel School, uh, and he was the senior pastor at that church. Uh, he had a bout with cancer for a long period of time, and he just uh, recently succumbed and went home to his reward in heaven. So not only is uh, Kurt's wife hurting and his family hurting, but that church is gonna need direction and guidance and someone stepping into that role. They had, the assistant pastor had left, not related to this, to, to do something else. And so they literally are pastorless um, my best, my best friend Rick was teaching a Bible study for them on Wednesday. Uh, uh, same time we do our Zoom, he teaches Wednesday night. He's also in the Book of Romans. He's about four chapters behind us, and uh, they have asked Rick to step in temporarily to be the interim pastor. Uh, and so, who would ever thought, you know, when we were talking about Rick retiring in a couple of years, that he would be yeah. standing behind the pulpit? So God. God's, God will provide, God will yes, sustain them, but I just ask you to be in prayer for Melbourne Community Church and specifically Kurt's family, because uh, I know they're, they're hurting right now. It's a very painful loss for that community of believers. Okay. And with that, I'm going to ask you guys to put yourselves on mute, and I'm going to launch into Romans chapter 9, and we're going to finish chapter 9. At the end of the today, and I'll make this announcement twice, when we're done with chapter nine, we're going to take a two-week uh, Christmas break. So we will not be meeting the Wednesday before Christmas and the Wednesday before New Year's. And then we will resume chapter 10 after the first of the year. So we've got a couple of exciting things. We've got 16 chapters. We're going to be through nine of them at the end of today. And making our way through the final 16. I hope you guys have enjoyed Romans. I hope you've enjoyed the education and how it solidifies your faith and what you believe and why you believe and how you believe and uh, all kinds of other criteria. So uh, with that being said, if you'll turn to your Bibles and go to the book of Romans chapter nine and go to verse 17 while I do a recap and you're flipping your pages. So Again, chapters one through eight, Paul does this astoundingly good attorney-like job of laying out the entire doctrine of Christianity. He starts with this offer of salvation, uh, this offer of life, and then you can almost hear the in a, in a Q and A type session somebody act, asking in the background, "That sounds great, but I don't need it." Then he spends several chapters brutalizing you to let you know everybody 
needs this offer and what broken wretches that we really are. And then in chapter five, he goes and talks about his grace because you may be thinking at this point, well, no, I've done way too many things before and after I became a Christian. And I hope by the end of chapter five, you realize how big God is and how little you are. So your little bitty ability to sin can never overwhelm the infinite God's powerful grace. And then we got to chapter seven and Paul is having an internal struggle. Um, seven, you could see this wrestling match. Okay, he knows all this truth. And he's compelled to, to, to follow God, yet in his own beautiful words, he says, yet the things that I know I should do, I don't do. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, I do. And so he's got this struggle. And we see the struggle shift to the end of chapter 7 and beginning of chapter 8, where he has some kind of an epiphany. And it concerns the Holy Spirit. So we spoke in chapter 8 about some principles that, you know, God, you can't save yourself. First of all, you're a wretch. You can't save yourself, even when you recognize you're a wretch. You need God for salvation. But guess what? You need God for sanctification, too. So Paul discovers this and realizes, I've got a power in me, the Holy Spirit, at the time of my salvation, and I'm not accessing that. So he goes through a process of explaining how we access this power that's in us to give us more wins than losses. Now, it doesn't mean you're never going to have a loss again. That means you wouldn't be, you would be sinless for the rest of your life. I'm not sure any of us have reached that point, but it does mean that if you know how to access this power on a consistent basis, you will have more victories in your life. And so there was all about ASK, 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 seek, knock. But you're not asking for the problem. You're not asking for the provision. You're not asking for the guidance. What you're asking and seeking and knocking is for the power of the Holy Spirit to be present in you. It's for the Holy Spirit to take over and run the show. And then instead of worrying about your donkeys, he says, then relax. Just fellowship with me. Hang out with me. And as St. Augustine was once famously asked, what's your secret? How did you get to be, you know, so saintly? And he go, oh, that it's easy. Love God with all your heart and then go and live your life. You see, the key is if we focus on the relationship and, and just hanging out and being with God, the Holy Spirit will steer you. The Holy Spirit will be your cruise control. And we talked about Tesla and the autopilot, which is not perfected, obviously. But in any case, we, God's autopilot works perfectly if we will just yield to it. Then chapter 9, he brings in in 9, 10, and 11 something that looks disjointed, like it doesn't seem to fit in the book, but it does. He's going to use the Jews as an example, because again, in the background, he hears a question, somebody yammering in his ear going, yeah, well, you know, that sounds good that he's going to help me and get me through to the end and see me through, but you know, I look at the situation with the Jews, and you know, they were his chosen people, and Look at them. They're in disarray. Most of them don't follow him. But he didn't. He didn't. And they, until 1942, they didn't even have a nation. So, you know, I don't see how God uh, came through for them. And so Paul spent the first part of chapter nine. And today also some more illustrations showing that, hey, I didn't fail the Jews. I did exactly what I said I was going to do. And exactly the right number of Jews responded to that. We talked about that last week. The early church for the first couple of decades was almost entirely Jewish people. The Gentiles didn't start coming into the scene until Paul began some of his missionary journeys and reaching out into Gentile lands. But up until then, that remnant was preserved, just as God promised in Isaiah and Hosea and other prophetic books. And we'll talk about this today. God never promised the entire nation of Israel to be saved, but he did promise a remnant. Just like today, when they do the surveys, and they stick a mic in your face and they go, what, what faith are you? And some people say none, right? And some people go, oh, I'm a Christian or I believe in God. Now, just because you say you're something doesn't mean that you are something. 
And we talked about that. You guys are sitting in churches and there's people all around you who are there for other reasons not related to relating to God. They may be there for business reasons. They may be there because they were pressured by their mom, dad, spouse, whoever. Um, maybe they're there to try to find a, find a spouse, you know, shopping for a good girl or a good boy, uh, looking for uh, fields white under harvest in the wrong way. But there's all kinds of people in churches that would consider themselves to be Christians, but are not. God says, I never failed Israel. And so we're going to talk about that today in nine. And I think there's a really good point that Paul is going to end on. It has to do with your main message. Last week's main message was, is God fair? And we got into God's sovereignty and man's free will. And we try to, to weave those together as best as our human mind can. But it, we, what we discussed and, and hopefully finalized in your mind from last week is fair is fair. God is fair. What's fair, if you really understand where you're at, is you're a broken, wicked thing. You're broken. And what fair is, is you go to hell. That's fair. It's just like if you commit first degree murder, what's fair? You go to jail or maybe you're executed. But that's fair. We would all agree that that's fair. What we want to appeal to is we get fair and mercy confused. And last week, I hope we finalized that in your head, that mercy isn't required, because if, if you require mercy, then it's not mercy anymore by definition. If you just define what the word means, mercy is something that isn't required, it's freely given, and it can be given to some and not to others, and still be merciful and still be fair. All right, so Paul's going to expound on that this week as we finish chapter nine, and what we're going to come across when we finish this is a verse about the stumbling. We call it the stumbling block in our culture. Oh, he's a stumbling block. That's a stumbling block to him. But in the original verses, it was the stumbling stone. Okay. So we're going to talk about the stumbling stone as we finish chapter nine. So let's begin with chapter nine, verse 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, so the first he's going to do, he's going to use the Egyptian Pharaoh back in the time when the Israelis were held captive in that nation. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I, God, have raised you up, Pharaoh, that I may show my power in you, and that my name will be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and on whom he wills, he hardens. So, what happened in the time of Pharaoh is Moses was God's man on the scene, and Moses made a simple request, let our people go. Cecil B. DeMille, Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments, come on, guys. You remember, right? And yeah, yeah. Pharaoh said, no way, not going to do it. And there were 10 plagues. You remember each one more severe than the next, and each time... Pharaoh was given an opportunity to change his heart, but he didn't. Instead, he hardened his heart. And God says, I allowed this to happen. I allowed Pharaoh to come to power and become almighty in the world, as far as humans go, so that when I humble him, everybody will know who the real power is. And I, God, will be glorified by Pharaoh's humbling. Okay? So he has mercy on those that he wills, and on those he wills, he hardens. Sometimes God will, and we've all been here. We're going to do a hand raise here in a minute, so be ready. We, God will sometimes show mercy and glorify himself through showing mercy. Other times, God will be glorified through a man's hardness and watching that man crumble to pieces. Have you ever, as a believer, wanted something that wasn't necessarily God's will, but you pushed it and pushed it and kept asking for it and pushed it, manipulated things and justified things and rationalized things until you finally got it? But it wasn't God's will. That's a hardening of the heart on, on, a, on a micro scale. You basically know what right is 
but you suppress right because you want this thing so bad. And if you've ever been in that position, and I've been in that position, have you ever been in that position where you perhaps bucked God and rationalized it the whole way? And then when you got what you wanted, you found out, oh my gosh, what a train wreck this is. Yeah, Lee's got his hand up, Marty, me, Ned, Ron, there goes Donna. I mean, most of us have been there. Most of us have been there. Don't think when it says he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that you have this sweet, innocent, loving Pharaoh, and God forced him to become hard towards himself and Israel. That isn't what the scripture said. God simply allowed Pharaoh's heart to pursue its natural inclination. Praise God that sometimes he prevents us from following our natural inclination. Have you ever been down a path that God puts a hard stop on you because you're going down the wrong way. I mean, I mean, it's a brutal hard stop. But, you know, thank God, because if the results, if you kept going down that path, the results would have been catastrophic. Let's go on. You can hear this question. Here we go again with this little, little annoying parrot in Paul's ear. You will say to me then, why does he, God, then still find fault? For who has resisted his will? So the first thing that, that's said here is, how can I be blamed? If God's in control, uh, how can, why do my actions even matter? And Paul at first doesn't answer this. He rebukes the question. He says, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to who? To him, God, who formed it? Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same look to make one vessel for honor and the other for dishonor? Paul imagines someone in the background asking, if it's all a matter of God's choices, then how can God find fault in me? Um, how can anyone go against God's choice? And this is where we do the intersection of God's sovereignty and man's free will. And Initially, he doesn't answer this protest. He will in the next series of verses. The first thing he does is say, how insolent, how arrogant. Who are you to reply against God? It, that question itself, Paul says, is disrespectful to the max. If God says that he gets to choose, but he also says you're responsible before him for the choices you make, who are you to protest? And then he uses the example of the potter and the clay. If God says we have eternal responsibility before him, who are you to say, no, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that God? No, God is sovereign and makes his own calls, but somehow interwoven in that, we have absolute freedom of choice and we're responsible for the choices that we make. This is Paul's point. Do you guys get this piece? All right. 22 through 24. Paul continues this train of thought. He goes mm -hmm. hypothetically, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory? even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So I'll explain this. What is he talking about? It's the same principle he used with Pharaoh. This is what he's talking about. Um, if God chooses to glorify himself, now listen to me, if God chooses to glorify himself through letting people go their own way and letting them righteously, righteously, fairly receive his wrath, so as to make his power known, who can call that unfair? Is it unfair when you're doing 90 and a 50 and the cop writes you a ticket? Well, that's mm -hmm. not fair. There was a guy doing 95 and he pulled me over. Oh, we've said that probably at one point. Maybe the numbers were a little different. That, that moron was passing people right and left. And I was just going with the flow of traffic. At the end of the day, were you speeding and is the ticket fair? 
And again, you need to be careful with how you use the English language. Fair is fair. Fair just means it's right. It's correct. It's accurate. Fair says if you speed, you can get a ticket. And you did get a ticket, so you can't claim it's not fair. And God says it's not unfair just because on some vessels, pottery, clay, I choose to show mercy and others, I choose to let them go their own way and receive the, the punishment that, that is fair to them. Do you guys understand that or is that messing you up? Okay, I get some head nodding. Um, if God chooses to be more fair with others, in other words, showing them his mercy, then who are you to protest? And this goes back to the parable where the workers, you know, um, Ned agrees to work for 100 bucks and he's hired at eight in the morning and the work's not getting done. So the landowner says, Dana, come on in, man. We need more help. And it's noontime. I'm going to give you 100 bucks. And then um, there's an hour to go and they're at crunch time and they're almost get, going to get this stuff done. And with an hour left to go, Lee comes on the scene and he goes, Hey, Lee, I'll give you 100 bucks. Work to the end of the day. We got to get this stuff finished. It's not right for Ned to say, well, that's not fair because Ned agreed to work eight hours for a hundred bucks. It's up to the landowner. It's his money. If he wants to be more generous with Lee, why is that not fair? If you've agreed to work for the eight hours for a hundred bucks, but how many times do you hear us saying that? And this is what Paul is saying. If God, and then he says, and he applies it to the Gentiles and the Jews. He said, and if God wants to show mercy to the Gentiles, as well as the Jews, of course, never being less than fair with either group, then who can protest? Who can oppose that? And this was the Jews' sticking point. It was always a, something that stuck in the craw of their throat that the Gentiles were considered dogs. And as the church began to develop, it was just uh, uh, almost unbelievable to the Jewish mind that they should be welcome into the family of Christ as well. And, and, and God says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can choose to be merciful to whoever I want to be merciful to because I'm God. I'm fair to everybody. But if I want to be merciful to the Gentiles and bring them into the family, oh, by the way, Israel, that was your mission statement multiple hundreds of years ago that you were to be a blessing to all the nations and you failed. So this isn't shouldn't be new news to you. I can choose to be merciful to the to the Gentiles. Verses 25 and 26. He's going to go through Hosea and Isaiah and point out to them now that it was always about a remnant. You see, the Jews thought in this arguer in the background of Jewish descent saying, oh, you know, he didn't take care of us. He didn't see us through. Uh, he's probably not going to see you Christians through either. And God said, no, 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 I never promised to bring the whole nation into salvation. Just read what I wrote through Hosea and read what I wrote through Isaiah. And you'll see that this was always the plan. There was always going to be a small percentage who really weren't just Jews by, by biology, but they were Jews because they had the faith of Abraham. Remember when we talked about in Romans, what's more important? your bloodline or your faith line. And what's the only thing that's important is your faith line. He, he, as he, he says in verse 25 and 26, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of God. Now, this is quoting Hosea 20, uh, excuse me, uh, 2.23 and Hosea 1.10. And it's showing the mercy of God, even towards the Gentiles, even though they weren't his people, they too will be called sons of God, not because of lineage or ancestry, but simply because they had the faith of Abraham and God chose to have mercy on them. Now, if you're a Bible student, you may object to this point. Because in Hosea, and this is a sticking point for people, but I don't have any problem with it at all. 
they go, oh, this is what the Bible's flawed here. You see in the book of Hosea, this quote when Hosea was talking, isn't really talking about Gentiles. It's talking about the nation of Israel. And yet in Romans, Paul's using it to talk about the Gentiles. Whoa, did Paul miss up? Did Paul not know his Bible history very well? Um, okay, so if you believe in the doctrine of inerrancy and the doctrine of inspired truth, it means that whatever we read in our Bible, even though it was written by human beings a long time ago, when they were writing it, they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he was making sure what they committed down was real, factual, and was exactly what God wanted to say through them. So if that's the Holy Spirit doing that, and the Holy Spirit wanted this to apply to Israel in the Old Testament, and the Holy Spirit, if he's the author of the Bible, if, if he wanted this to... Uh, uh, um, explain the Gentiles in the New Testament in the book of Romans, why are you questioning that? You would only question and if you only consider these to be human author, authors and not inspired by anything. But the Bible itself, Hosea to Romans, all written ultimately in the background by God. So mm -hmm. if God wants to use this and apply it, to the Jews in Hosea and to the Gentiles in Romans. Uh, are you really going to try to fuss with him about that? Isn't it his right to reinterpret and reapply his words uh, later on to different groups of people? Isn't that his right? Oh, there's God's sovereignty again. All right, let's go 27 through 29. He's going to talk about Isaiah. Here he's quoting for Isaiah 10, 23 and verse 1. Nine, so kind of in reverse order. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Now, this is about the remnant. Though the number of the children of Israel be a sand of the sea, true statement that was promised to Abraham, it's going to be like the stars in the sky. You can't even count the number of your descendants. The remnant will be saved. Did it say the whole nation will be saved? Nope. It says the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, this is 110, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. So I'll finish the commentary on this and then we'll go to the break. Um, if you remember Sodom and Gomorrah, was there any remnant left when they, after they were done being judged? Not one stick, not one person, not one iota, nothing mm -hmm. was left. So uh, Isaiah is saying, unless he had left us a remnant, here's that word again, a seed, a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. But no, it's all about God has dealt, has always dealt with the remnant. It was kind of stupid to think that since the whole nation had not entered the blessing, that the promise of God had failed. So this person that's nibbling in Paul's ear about God's failure to Israel didn't even read the only Old Testament quotes from Hosea and Isaiah that talked about, no, it was never about the whole nation. Yes, there's a whole nation of Israel. It was always about the remnant. It was always about the remnant. And don't we have the remnant? Who started the first early church? Jews. I mean, that remnant principle has been there throughout time. Is there a nation of Israel now? Yes. Are they all following God? No. Are they biologically descendants of Abraham? Yes. Does God care more about biological descendants or faith descendants? Faith. Same reason that gets us in the door. So this all affirms God's efforts toward Israel was effective for the true seed of Abraham. He preserved the true Israel, a remnant, and he will faithfully preserve you. All right, we'll come back. We'll finish out. We're almost at the end of the chapter, and we'll see you back here as quick as you can hop off and hop on. You can look at your clocks and see we're going to finish early.
maybe have some time for some good Q&A, and then we're going to get to the stumbling block, the stumbling stone. So I'll see you guys back here in about a minute.